Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, Alexandra and Irene, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I want to thank the German Marshall Fund and the Bertelsmann Foundation for your support of this important annual study and for organizing today's events. As was mentioned, I've just returned from my first overseas trip as Deputy Secretary of State, which began with meetings uh, with both NATO and the EU leadership. I started my 11-day sojourn in Brussels because I wanted to demonstrate, as President Biden likes to say, that America is back. The transatlantic alliance is back. Over the last 75 years, the United States and our European allies and partners have built a durable, democratic, and prosperous transatlantic community. Ours is an alliance that shaped the 20th century for the better and helped deliver security and opportunity, not only for our own people, but for people everywhere. Today, the transatlantic community is facing new challenges, as we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic. A crisis in one country can quickly engulf the entire world. We're facing immediate and long-term threats from climate change, and our countries are under sustained attack by agents who are hostile to our democratic values and who seek to undermine the rules-based international order we've worked so hard to build together. It's clear to President Biden, it's clear to Secretary Blinken, and it's clear to me that the only way the United States can meet these challenges is by working with our allies and partners. And our transatlantic ties remain the strongest foundation we have for realizing a better future for ourselves and the world. This week, President Biden will underscore the United States' commitment to our multilateral alliances as he makes his first foreign trip to the United Kingdom and Belgium for summits with the G7, with NATO, and with the EU. The President will reiterate the United States' steadfast commitment to NATO. The common defense of our NATO allies is a sacred trust. The United States will always keep faith with Article 5 that an attack on one is an attack on all. And we will continue working with our partners to strengthen and modernize NATO to tackle the challenges and threats we face today. And President Biden will seek to advance a common agenda with our G7 and EU partners on a wide range of issues, from ending the COVID-19 pandemic and building our economies back better, to combating climate change and investing in clean energy, to deepening our collective defense of our democratic norms and institutions. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. The good news is that this is an agenda that has broad support from the public on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, I want to briefly highlight a few findings from the 2021 Transatlantic Trends Report released this week. There is a high level of trust on both sides of the Atlantic. A majority of Americans see our European partners as reliable, and majorities of Europeans feel the same about us. The transatlantic community remains strongly supportive of NATO. A majority of those surveys see NATO as important to their security, including more than six in 10 Americans. In the European Union and the United States, the public sees the People's Republic of China as, quote, more of a rival than a partner. And there is an overwhelming consensus that our country should take a tougher stance, particularly around human rights, cybersecurity, and climate change. These results tell us that the transatlantic relationship remains central, not only for the leaders of our countries, but for our people. I want to offer more concrete thoughts on three issues that are top priorities for President Biden, all of which are critical to the transatlantic community. Ending the COVID-19 pandemic is the most urgent task before us. In the United States and Europe, the vaccines are allowing us to move back toward normal life. But as I saw firsthand on my recent trip, the pandemic is only getting worse beyond our borders. Even countries that had managed to hold infection rates down for many months are now struggling with new variants and outbreaks. No one is safe until everyone is safe. The United States is committed to working with our partners to manufacture more vaccines and supplies, to provide humanitarian and economic assistance, and to make sure the world is better prepared 
for the next pandemic. Together, the United States and the European Union have pledged $45 billion to the global pandemic response. The United States has committed $4 billion to COVAX, more than any other nation. And we are working through the G7 and the G20 to accelerate aid both to end the pandemic and to rebuild the global economy to the benefit of working people everywhere. Last week, President Biden announced how the U.S. will be sharing the first 25 million vaccine doses with countries around the world, out of at least 80 million we intend to provide by the end of June. And I suspect there will be much more to come. As the president said when he made the announcement, quote, we are sharing these doses not to secure favors or to extract concessions. We are sharing these vaccines to save lives and to lead the world in bringing an end to the pandemic, end quote. We must also contend with a crisis that was with us before COVID-19 and will be with us long after. I'm talking, of course, about climate change. The Biden administration has put addressing climate change at the center of our foreign and domestic policy, and we aren't wasting any time because we know we don't have that luxury. The science tells us that we need to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius if we want to avoid catastrophe. But we're about two-thirds of the way to that catastrophe already. And the world is struggling to cope with more intense storms, deeper droughts, fiercer wildfires, and searing heat waves. That's why President Biden moved to rejoin the Paris Agreement on his first day in office. He appointed former Secretary of State John Kerry as his special presidential envoy for climate change. And the United States announced an ambitious new target to cut our greenhouse gases emissions in half by 2030. But just like ending the pandemic, we can't solve the climate crisis alone. We're working with our partners and allies every step of the way. That's why on Earth Day, President Biden convened 40 world leaders in a virtual climate summit We've restarted the major economies forum on energy and climate, an important multilateral platform that helped make the Paris Agreement possible. And we joined 22 other governments to launch the second phase of Mission Innovation, a global effort to develop and deploy more clean energy. Working together to combat climate change isn't just about staving off catastrophe, although that's important and urgent work. It's also about seizing opportunity. The United States and Europe are home to world-class research institutions and innovative technology companies. When we invest in clean energy infrastructure, we create jobs and economic opportunity, reduce air pollution that harms human health, and improve the quality of life for people everywhere. And we set our countries up to win the future. Finally, I want to talk about a challenge that's going to help define the next century and that is the relationship between the United States, the EU, and China. I was pleased to join the first high-level meeting of the US-EU Dialogue on China two weeks ago. It was a productive and wide-ranging discussion, and the dialogue promises to be an important forum for collaboration as European capitals reassess their relationships with Beijing. In recent years, China has used increasingly aggressive tactics to threaten the economy, security, and values of the United States and of our partners and allies. Beijing is targeting investments in critical infrastructure around the world and engaging in brazen thefts of intellectual property. They are committing appalling crimes against humanity and acts of genocide in Xinjiang. And they are waging a coercive campaign to undermine democratic values and rewrite the rules of the international system to favor their authoritarian approach to governance. The United States position is clear. Our relationship with China will be collaborative where it can be, competitive where it should be, and adversarial where it must be. Our aim is not to contain China or to force other countries to choose sides. I made that crystal clear during my recent trip to Europe and Southeast Asia. Our goal is to uphold the rules-based international system that has benefited all of us for decades. 
protecting freedom and human dignity, promoting prosperity and innovation, and keeping the peace. Where we can, it's imperative that we work with China, especially on issues that are truly global in scope, like climate change and health security. And as President Biden has said, we welcome healthy competition with China on technology and the economy, because so long as we're all playing by the same rules, we're confident that the world's democracies can win the jobs and industries of the future. But when the PRC violates international norms and undermines the rules of the road, we won't hesitate to take a stand. And for the United States, that means working with our partners and allies. The coordinated sanctions the U.S. and the EU together with Canada and the U.K. issued for human rights abuses in Xinjiang earlier this year showed that when we come together in defense of our values, we can put serious pressure on Beijing. I remarked at the end of my time in Brussels recently that I'd been married to my husband, Bruce, for 41 years, and we don't see eye to eye on everything. But we've always managed to find our way forward because we agree on so much more and because we know how to work through our disagreements. I see the transatlantic relationship in similar terms. I've spoken to three big challenges today where our interests are aligned and where there are many more issues that we can touch on during our conversation. There are, of course, other areas where the United States and our transatlantic allies don't agree and where we will continue to discuss our differences. But when one is standing on a firm foundation, a foundation of shared values, enduring trust and common goals, these discussions can only strengthen our relationship. And that is why the Transatlantic Alliance will continue to shape the world for the better in this century. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you today. I look forward to taking your questions and salute uh, the German Marshall Fund and its partners on the Transatlantic Trends Survey. Thank you.